Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join a community cultivating civil discourse. Stay well informed while improving access to enlightening and thought-provoking programming for all. Welcome to today's virtual program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Mark Zitter, a member of the club's Board of Governors, chair of the Zetima Project, and your moderator for today. The club, of course, has shifted from in-person programs to virtual events, and we're grateful for the support of our viewers. I encourage you to consider making a donation at the club to support our wonderful programming. If you wish to do so, please text the word donate to 415-329-4231, or you can donate by visiting the club's website at commonwealthclub.org. I also want to remind you to submit questions for our guest via the chat room next to your screen. I will get to as many as I possibly can after the showing of this documentary short you'll be hearing about, Caregiver, A Love Story. And to set up the film, it's now my pleasure to introduce today's guest, Dr. Jessica Zitter, physician and co-director and producer of the documentary, which she made with the filmmaker, Kevin Gordon. Dr. Zitter is a national advocate for transforming the way people die in America. She is a Harvard and UCSF trained physician practicing the unusual combination of critical care and palliative care medicine, and works as an attending physician at Highland Hospital in Oakland, California. She writes frequently for the New York Times and many other publications. Her book, Extreme Measures, Finding a Better Path to the End of Life, was published by Penguin Random House in 2017. That same year, she was the featured physician in Extremis, a short documentary that was nominated for an Oscar and two Emmy Awards, and now is streaming on Netflix. Also, as you may gather from our last name, she's also my wife. So Jessica, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Thrilled to be Please, here. Please, great. Please tell our audience about the film that they're about to see. Well, just a quick summary of the film is that it follows the last nine weeks of Bambi Fass's life. Uh, she was at home on hospice. Um, it follows her husband's experience as well. Um, they live in Oakland. They're friends of ours, actually, and um, really shows what happened when she brought hospice in to focus on maximizing her quality of life before she died. Great. Thanks. So we are going to uh, show you the film. Jessica and I will, will uh, log off for a moment and we'll see you back in about 24 minutes when the film is finished. And we'll have a discussion about it. Thanks very much. I'm not going to say I'm not scared. Who doesn't want to just go to sleep and not wake up, you know? Hopefully it'll just be peaceful and quiet and not cause too much pain to the ones I love. We're just kind of thrust into the role sometimes. And you have to step up. I knew the dancer was starting to take over. We weren't engaged yet. And I told him, this is your get out of jail free card. Next weekend, he came out, pulled out a box. I didn't even open up the box. Just fell into his arms and said yes. It was a pretty big decision because I basically had to leave work. How are you feeling? Are you comfortable? You're not in pain. I'm not trained for this, but this is the best thing for her. How are you? I'm hanging in there. It's a little tough, but I'm doing the best I can. I'm hoping they're going to do is raise the methadone dose a little up. The decline has been more difficult than I expected. What happened? And I feel like my health is deteriorating with hers. This is a journey for the end of her life, and I want to give her the best care I can give her. It's all about love. We are about to discuss issues of caregiving raised by the film, including those related to COVID-19. Now, if you'd like to see the entire 24-minute documentary short, there are virtual screenings at the Roxy Theater in San Francisco and at the, the Lamely Theater in Los Angeles throughout the next four weeks. And you can also go to 
caregiverlovestory.com, all one word, caregiverlovestory.com, for information on other ways to see this important film. I believe those links are below your screen as well. So, Jessica, a big thanks to you and your co-director, Kevin Gordon, for making this powerful film. I have to admit, I've seen it many times, and it still gets me every time. I still have the Kleenex out. <laughs> Uh, but let me ask you some questions, and we've got some from the audience, too. First of all, people always want to know the origin story for a film like this, and it's curious because you're a doctor specializing in end-of-life care. You were in the hospital, in the ICU. Your first film, The Extremis, uh, was filmed in the ICU. So how did it come about that you made a film not about medicine and hospitals, but about informal at-home caregiving? Great question. Um, it was an accident, quite honestly. Um, I mean, I'm a hospital-based physician. I'm an, you know, I spend most of my time, much of my time in the ICU. And I did not think really about what happens to people when they leave the hospital. And I would suggest and, and suspect that that's the case with many of my healthcare professional colleagues. Um, so, you know, extremis was a no-brainer. It was easy. It was where I was. It was in the ICU. It was about how do we make death better from the perspective of being an ICU patient. Um, but Rick and Bambi, this was the first time I followed somebody home. They were my friends. I helped get Bambi set up in hospice. And so I was there and it was really my first experience. And I saw this up close and personal, something that, as I said, most of us, I think, don't get a chance to see. And at first, everything was going as I expected. And really, this was supposed to be a story about how getting off the end of life conveyor belt, getting out of the hospital if you're dying is often a good thing. And it was, it was about celebrating that. And it was really only when Kevin, my co-director, Kevin Gordon, gave me his first approach at the rough edit, the first rough cut of this film, that I realized I had missed the entire story. It wasn't about Bambi. It wasn't about dying at home. It was about the experience of this caregiver, this person, and the 53 million other caregivers in America like Rick. Yeah. We just said 53 million. That's a big number. I know you've often called uh, caregiving a public health crisis. So just how big or bad or serious is it? It's very big. It's very serious. And it's getting worse. Um, more than one in five Americans is a caregiver in a given year um, for somebody needing help due to disability or serious illness. And that 50, that's 53 million people. And that's up from the report in 2015 from the Na National Alliance on Caregiving that showed 44 million people. So there are more uh, caregivers. There's more people needing care, as you can imagine, from demographic shifts. There are baby boomers aging, people keep being kept alive with chronic illnesses for longer. Um, families have fewer kids, fewer people to take care of uh, the given care recipients. And there's divorce and there's debt. And all of these demographic changes are happening. And so there is this ratio that is reversing and the number of care recipients to, to care providers is going in the wrong direction rapidly. Um, and COVID is obviously putting a massive magnifying glass on this problem and exacerbating it significantly. So um, these people are all going home. By the way, more people want to die at home as well. Since 2017, 2017 was the first year in over a hundred years that more people died at home than in institutions. And the money is not following them home. So we've got these caregivers who are more burdened, they're untrained, they're unsupported, they're unpaid. Um, they're 60% of them are doing tasks that were traditionally done by nurses. I mean, pretty intensive tasks and sometimes connecting IV tubing, working with nebulizer machines, et cetera. Most have no paid help. Half of them don't even have help from family or friends. They're doing it on their own. And the vast majority of people like Rick can't afford help. 34% um, of people, that's more than a third of people use up their, their personal savings doing caregiving. Um, people are losing their jobs or they have to leave their jobs. And you can imagine this is significantly exacerbated by COVID. So this is a wake up call for all of us. Um, and for me, <laughs> who didn't know about this issue until my, I made this movie with Kevin, um, yeah. we've got to do better. And the movie beautifully showed the story of Rick and Bambi, one couple, but you said 53 million. So how, what's typical about Rick and Bambi's experience and what's unusual? Well, you know, we all watch this film and we feel this profound pain for Rick and his experience. And we think of him as a hero and wow, was he ever. But even with his, you know, responsibility towards his granddaughter and the, the pain that we witness in the film, Rick actually is one of the lucky ones. Because when you look at the demographics of caregivers, 
he had it easier than most. You know, he was healthy. He was relatively young. Uh, many, many caregivers are elderly um, and themselves unable to really manage the physical stress of taking care of somebody. He did this for nine weeks. Do you know that the average caregiver does this for four and a half years? Wow. Rick had some savings. I mean, he was able to float for those nine weeks, but imagine the people who do this for longer than nine weeks, which is the majority. Um, he had a supportive community. A lot of people are doing this completely alone. And don't forget, Rick was caring for Bambi. They were newlyweds. She was, I mean, this amazing woman. She she did everything she could to help him, even in her d disabled state. And um, she, if I have to wear depends, I'll wear depends, right? Um, if anyone is going to have the strength to kind of the relationship strength to carry them through this experience, it's going to be Rick and Bambi. So Rick really had it easier than most, and it was still almost impossible. No. Well, I'm going to guess that among our audience today, we have some people who are caregivers and uh, even more perhaps who will be caregivers at some point. What support is available for caregivers or people in Rick's situation? Well, let's, let's start by with, maybe start with the bad news. The bad news is we don't have enough support. We don't have enough of any kind of a national program for supporting caregivers. What support out is uh, that is out there is sometimes hard to find, hard to access. It doesn't come finding the caregiver. It's it's there's a lot of well-meaning programs out there, but it's it's hard to navigate them. Respite care is one example, one that Rick did use, and and certainly some people don't even realize that those are those kinds of benefits exist out there. There's other types of programming out there. I mean, adult day programs, which are a huge and very important part of the caregiving experience of people who are caregiving for patients with, um, with uh, dementia and other types of things. There's, there's meal programs, there's transportation support, but it's hard to use. And, you know, it's, it's, it's especially hard to use when you don't have anyone guiding you there. And when you think about us in the hospital, we're like a magnet for caregivers, right? Inpatient hospitals, I mean, inpatient environments, outpatient clinics. This is where the caregivers are. And we in the healthcare profession, many of us don't even know about this issue. And we certainly don't have integrated approaches to channeling people from this environment of the hospital or the clinic into the support of the community and these social programs. So we've got to do a better job at getting people to those programs that exist. Um, but we really do have a lot of, I mean, I think we really want to rethink as a, as a nation and as a society, do we want to do better? Do we want to provide more support legislatively um, to, to people? And I'm excited that, that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have some very robust sounding plans uh, going forward about enhancing the support for family caregivers out there, providing them with uh, social security, even while they're doing caregiving, if they have to leave their jobs, um, providing them with extra tax credits and making family medical leave, for example, paid instead of an unpaid uh, benefit. But there, there, and, and, and a lot of people who really work in this, in this area do feel optimistic about some of the stuff that's coming down the pike, but that's, um, there's work that needs to be done there. And from the other perspective, the unprofessional, the non-professional resource approaches is that what I call homegrown help. There's a lot of home ways to, to harness people's communities and families better than we're doing right now. And I think that comes with building awareness about this issue. Um, if we just, you know, Rick and Bambi, uh, our synagogue community wanted to help but they were doing the things that we kind of traditionally do, which is bring food, bring food, come and sit for 15 minutes. But honestly, that's not what Rick needed. Rick needed someone to do a load of laundry. Rick needed someone to take Maya on a play date. Rick needed, I mean, Rick needed just a little bit of decompression of his weekly schedule so that he could have a little bit of time to himself. And there are a lot of tasks that could have been delegated to others that we just weren't organized to do with all of the good intent. So would you recommend that if a community is trying to support someone, say a church or a synagogue or a, some other or a community organization? Neighborhoods, that, friends, anybody. But that they think through what the person may need, which is usually the default is food. And then the person has too much food and not enough of everything else. Yeah. How about right, so you mentioned laundry, you mentioned you know, errands, you mentioned taking the kid for a couple, a couple of hours or something like that. Anything else that people could do that might be helpful? I think, well, I think like so many of the things that we do in palliative care, it's about being curious. It's about asking. It's about asking Rick. It's identifying who is Rick. Okay. Our rabbi sees that there's somebody who is a caregiver. Let's get a committee that then goes 
and talks to Rick and says, hey, Rick, you know, we, we would like to talk to you about what might be helpful. What are some things that we could take off your list? Let's ask Rick what mm-hmm. would be helpful to him. Yeah, yeah. Now, you talked about some of the things the Biden administration has mentioned. Uh, we have a question from the audience about what national strategy do you suggest to address this crisis? And it sounds like there's a few things the Biden administration has talked about. Do those link to the kind of national strategy you're talking about? Or what else would you like to see? Well, I mean, I, I think that that, you know, I want to just put a caveat out there, which is to say, um, I'm still learning about this issue. Um, so I'm not, I don't even consider myself. I mean, I wish I Jen Pu was here <laughs> to really talk about it, or, or somebody from the family caregiver Alliance, um, to, in fact, yesterday on, on forum, if anyone wants to go back to their archives forum, uh, the show on KQED, we did have a, um, a panel where we talked about the film and then we had, uh, me and, uh, Christina Irving from the family caregiver Alliance, uh, who's, which is a fabulous organization that deals with caregivers uh, issues. So you might want to listen to it because there were some very good suggestions on there, but I think the thing about strategy is that it's going to involve multiple systems. There is no one, I mean, there are so many systems that are involved in a healthcare, in a caregiver's life. They include the healthcare system. They include their employers. They include legislative uh, considerations and, and laws, state and federal laws that support caregivers. Um, they include their communities if you know, and, and their neighborhoods. I mean, there's many, many different systems that are going to have to start thinking about this uh, and coming in and integrating and, and, and creating more of a safety net so that these caregivers aren't falling through it. Mm-hmm. Uh, one question we got from the audience is about you. What's the impact of all of this on you? And what have you learned as both a doctor and a human being from your work in caregiving? Oh, wow. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you that as with a lot of the, the things that I put out into the public, um, I am showing a little bit of ignorance here. I mean, I feel, there's a truth, I feel a little embarrassed about the fact that I learned about family caregiver burden uh, this way. I wish that I had gone out to make a film about ca- family caregiver burden. I wish it hadn't happened by accident. Um, and that this was, but I now that I'm aware of it, um, I really... I feel that we must shout it from the rooftops and start to think about what we as, you know, members of the society want to stand for. And um, so it's impacted me in a couple of ways. It's made me feel again, like here's an issue and a cause that I've sort of stumbled upon and I must bring raise awareness to a variety of different groups. Uh, let's bring this to Capitol Hill. <laughs> let's go talk to people. But I also feel in truth a little bit embarrassed that it took me this long to figure it out. Uh, I want to help my fellow physicians and nurses and healthcare professionals understand that we need to be thinking beyond the walls of the hospital. This is a very important piece. We're a very integral part of the uh, of a very important system that needs to initiate some of the work that needs to be done here. So I think that well, that bears on a question, done. another question we got from the audience, uh, which is how can palliative care teams better support caregivers? Well, as you know, I'm a big advocate of the work that we do in palliative care. Um, not so much because it's palliative care, but because it's it's really the first system that I am aware of in, in the healthcare world that just believes philosophically in the holistic approach to a person. It's certainly not what I learned when I was training in the intensive care unit. It wasn't the way we were taught to think. Palliative care has made me understand that there are so many different angles to a person. But again, even as I was practicing palliative care, I was focusing on the patient. Their family was important, but it was all within the context of the hospice, uh, the hospital. I want to take that interprofessional, interdisciplinary, holistic approach that palliative care has taught me and extend it to all of the social determinants that, that exist outside of the hospital that people come in with that we don't necessarily pay as much attention to as we want, as we should. And certainly family caregiver situation and status is one of those things. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the hospital, you have much more of a controlled environment. Once someone goes home, not only don't you know exactly what's happening, but you can't control whether their dishwasher breaks or they run out of food or something like that. Right. I mean, we, we, you know, in our public hospital, we're frequently sending very sick people back to live in their cars, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, And we, we think about it's painful, but, you know, and, and I want to say one other thing uh, about the healthcare provider, and this sort of goes back to the other question about how does it impact me? I once read, and I believe this, that one of the biggest sources of distress for healthcare providers, one of the biggest 
causes of burnout is watching, being involved in care of patients for whom you have no control over their social situation. And I think it is one of the most painful things to witness um, when people have social situations that you can't control. And as we said, our, we don't have a great, robust safety net from a social perspective. And it's really hard to witness that. And so what we tend to do sometimes is ignore it, turn away from it. And I think that we, we really need to start to face it and, and start to demand a change. Now, any good palliative care team will have a social worker on it. Do you think informal caregivers at home caregivers could um, ask the social worker for some more help than they currently do? Would, would that be a useful thing? I think there's a very, very important role for social workers, particularly the social workers that are on palliative care teams who are, you know, a lot, I mean, I, I hate to say this, and I'm sure it's different at different hospitals, but at many hospitals, social workers really are often in the role of thinking about discharge planning and kind of get moving people along and kind of keeping things flowing. And there isn't a lot of time that people take to really, again, spend time delving into these issues that what is going on at home. And I think we've got to do, the, the social workers do it more than anybody, particularly the palliative care social workers. But I think we, we, you know, the care, I think it's the CARE Act that came out in 2014, requires hospitals. I think it's now, I think it's 30 states maybe are doing it. Uh, it's a federal act that came from AARP that is now turned into law in several different states, which requires that hospitals identify caregivers and prepare them before discharge. And that's a great start. The problem is that a lot of the tasks that were expected of these teams to prepare the caregivers for going home really were medical nursing tasks. Now, it's very important to make sure people understand the medical nursing tasks that they're going to have to take care of. But there's a lot more that I think we should be doing, a lot more. We should really be more clearly explaining to family what awaits them at home, that they are going to be responsible for the housekeeping and the hygiene issues. Even when we can send hospice, which is a wonderful service, home, um, there is other stuff that the family is primarily going to be responsible for. And I think we in the hospital have a huge responsibility and primary care clinics, a huge responsibility in preparing families for that because they can then figure out, well, what resources do I have? They have time to do that enlistment of the homegrown help. And we have a responsibility to set them up so that they can start doing this planning earlier. Well, clearly this has been a problem for a number of years. It's been getting worse. And then as we all know, over the last year, we have a new problem layered on top of it called COVID-19. So how has COVID-19 impacted the family caregiver burden issue? COVID-19 is crushing the crushed. The caregivers are all were already barely on the edge of making it work, as we've just described. And then COVID-19 came along. And so all of the consequences that family caregivers experience in the regular pre-pandemic time, which include major financial consequences, um, employment consequences, which tie in with financial consequences, their own health consequences, and certainly emotional distress and depression, um, it are significantly exacerbated. You can only imagine in an environment where you can't, now it's no longer safe to bring any help into the house, whether it's paid, which many can't afford, or even family who could come off and offload you, that is closed. Uh, a lot of programming that could have helped with the, taking care of uh, care recipients like adult day programs shut down. Um, all the training workshops um, and other types of support groups, a lot of those uh, were not being done typically on Zoom. I think things are starting to happen more virtually just out of necessity. But a lot of the support that family caregivers had, however little it was, was just cut off. And on top of that, they were teaching their kids in school, the caregivers, or they were, you know, um, trying to manage this person who, t who, who, who has so many needs all alone with no support. So it has become a tremendous it's 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 just pushed this thing over the edge. It's and in a way, it as awful as it is, it's an opportunity for us to see this sort of steadily growing public health crisis and see it really escalating. And hopefully, now especially with this change in government, this may be an opportunity for us to really take this seriously and start to do something. And by the way, pre-pandemic 
caregiver burden, impact, like so many other social challenges, impacts the most vulnerable in our society more. So women, minorities, they're the ones who experience the brunt of this. Uh, people who are wealthier can can afford to get more support and 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 are are obviously doing having their own challenges. But this is a very important um, group that we need to think about. That's really suffering. And obviously, COVID COVID has just advanced that significantly. So, for example, I just there was an article in the New York Times a few weeks back that basically said that women, for example, are leaving jobs because of caregiving responsibilities at a rate of four to one over men. And there was a prediction that this would set women back professionally by 10 years. African-American families are uh, experiencing far greater uh, employment and work financial consequences as a result of caregiving during COVID. Um, this is devastating and, and we must be quick to correct it. Yeah. I also understand uh, that with all the concerns about COVID in nursing homes, some people are taking their loved ones home yeah. from nursing homes and others are not going into nursing homes in the first place, which just ramps up the uh, the at-home caregiver burden, I'm sure. Absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. Absolutely. You know, as your movie just so beautifully showed or starkly showed, caregivers make huge personal sacrifices, financial, career sacrifices, social, sleep, their health, and so forth. Yet, interestingly, the dominant feeling that so many of them have is guilt. They feel guilty they're not doing more, even though they're making all these heroic and selfless efforts. So, how can caregivers preserve their mental health through the long-term stressful situation they find themselves in? First, the first and important piece is when you don't acknowledge as a larger society um, the struggles that some groups are going through, in this particular case, caregivers, then there is this sort of perception both within the greater society and within the caregivers themselves that somehow there isn't a problem and that they shouldn't be complaining. They shouldn't be struggling. And there's this, you know, I'm, I'm his wife or I'm her daughter. I should love should carry me through this. But the fact is that is true in the movies. It's not true in real life. And I think the first thing that we all need to do caregivers included, is to acknowledge this crisis, to have caregivers see themselves in this role and forgive themselves for the stresses that they're feeling and for the feelings of not being able to keep up, to understand that they're part of a vulnerable group that really deserves support and that we need to step up, the rest of us who are not yet caregivers, and provide that support, whether it's, again, through legislative change or through personal one-to-one support of a caregiver. Um, there's other things, of course, that a, that a caregiver can do to get support. One is to try to figure out how to fit into the existing professional uh, resources that are out there in the community. And that's hard when you're so buried by, by work and exhaustion to figure out how to get help. And we have a, re a reference that we're going to put out there that's a good place to start. We'll give that, that link. Um, you know, a lot of times people will say, you know, it's really important that you take some time for yourself, even if you, you know, that's easy to say to somebody if it's, you know, who, but it's really hard to do it when you're just literally submerged by responsibilities and work. Um, I think, you know, family members can kind of help the, the designated daughter who's the family caregiver for the mother swoop in and help figure out how you can alleviate that support. But it's, it's asking a lot of the caregiver to fix this problem because the caregiver is the one who needs help. I've heard too, there's some uh, online um, caregiver support groups as well, just so you can talk to other people in the same situation, if you can make time for those as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, you've all, for years, you've been a big fan, uh, where appropriate, of hospice at home. You actually helped both of my parents get into hospice when, at the end of their lives. And yet in the film, it's very interesting, uh, you seem very surprised at how little hospice at home can provide in terms of time. Talk about how hospice at home, where, where the limits of what it can do and, 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 and what it can't do. Okay. Well, I want to start out by saying I love hospice. Mm -hmm. Hospice is the best that we have. And so one of my biggest fears when we were making this film, and that's why Kevin and I had to do many, 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 many edits to make sure that this did not come through, was this incredible fear I had that, that somehow people were going to say, hey, wait a minute, where was hospice? Hospice wasn't doing a good job. Hospice did a great job. What people don't understand, there are many, many myths about what hospice is. 
Hospice is an amazing service. Hospice is the reason that Bambi was able to be at home. She would not have been able to be home without hospice support. Hospice, there is a group of professionals who manage symptoms, manage durable medical equipment like oxygen and, and the beds and, and, and the medications and come up with a plan to mitigate the medical symptoms and the existential and spiritual symptoms that somebody is having to the best possible. But hospice is paid about 150 to $200 a day. This is a benefit that was started in the 1980s. It is obsolete. We need to do give either we need to pay hospice more money so that they can put more staffing in here, or we need to have other support services coming in and supplementing what hospice is doing. But hospice is not there to change diapers, to wash sheets, to clean up. That's not their job. Their job is to provide medical symptom support to a patient and as much as possible to the family, but not in the form of these types of, of tasks. So it can do a lot, but you shouldn't expect it to be the primary caretaker. Right. And it's a wonderful service. So please want, I want people in the early versions, when we first made the film, I remember showing it to a couple of our friends in New Jersey. And at the end of the film, someone said, wait a minute, maybe I want to die in the hospital. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, wait, have you seen Extremis? <laughs> you don't want to die in the hospital. You, you don't. Um, that, and I realized that we had to really clarify that, that it's not that you want to die in the hospital. What you really want is to, we want to create systems that include the wonderful hospice that are really going to provide a robust set of support for families as they go through this at home. What, uh, uh, what's most surprised you as you learn more and more about caregiver burden? That's a good question. Um, I mean, what's obviously what surprised me was that I didn't know about it. That was, if it's sort of the, the, the thing I keep saying is if I didn't know about it, dot, 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 then who else doesn't know about it? I mean, you know, I, I imagine there's probably a lot of people saying, well, you should have known about it. You know, most palliative care people know about it. I would argue that's not true. I don't think that most hospital-based physicians really know about this unless they've experienced it personally, which I hadn't. Um, so that was shocking. And we're currently creating uh, programming for medical school, medical students, medical residents. Oh, I want to create one for nurses. We're uh, actually just uh, trying to create one now for hospices that would basically be a program around this film where you, you watch the film and then you have a discussion in whatever group you are a part of that would really sort of expand awareness and start making people think about how they might sort of improve their own personal systems and approaches to family caregivers. Mm -hmm. You just said something about the film piece. Tell me why you chose film as a way to raise awareness about this issue. Mm. Well, you know, it started with just writing stories. I'm a storyteller. I, I, I really just believe that the, the way to get people to listen is not to do a PowerPoint presentation and tell them st statistics and data, but to show them stories, stories that they can relate to, that, that, that they can empathize with, people that they can connect with on the screen. And, and frankly, I call it an emotional priming tool. I think stories and particularly film, because, you know, you, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, I'll tell you that a movie can be worth a thousand pictures. It can really bring people into an experience and make them reflect and make them feel things and unlock, I think, certain defenses that we tend to have um, and, and make us just raise our awareness. So I see it as an emotional priming tool. And I really believe that film can be used that way. And I, I hope that this film will, will also uh, serve that purpose. Oh, it's getting some play, which is great. Now, um, as you learned all these things about caregiving, how has it impacted your practice as a doctor? It's made me more aware. I, I, I will tell you, and I think this is important, you know, I, we don't have systems right now in, well, first of all, we're in COVID mm -hmm. and this film was completed right before COVID started. So I haven't really had a chance to take what I've learned from this whole experience of making this film that turned out to be an unexpected message and, and education for me and translating it necessarily into um, new approaches. So that 
has yet to be seen. What I'm hoping is that we're going to create programming in conjunction with social workers and people who really can kind of start to shake up the, the way we think about doing these types of things so that we can start to envision post-pandemic, hopefully, but maybe even pre-pandemic, a new approach to processing patients through our hospitals and our clinics where we really raise awareness, identify these family caregivers. Don't let them get away. We need to know who they are and then assess them. What is their level of stress? What exactly is causing them the mess stress? And then support them with whatever support we can provide and connections to community resources and then follow them up, which is a very, very important thing that I do believe the healthcare system is going to be responsible for because these people are so burdened that they don't follow up. They are neglecting their own health at great rates because of all of their care responsibilities. So as hos as, as hospital staff and clinic staff, we need to be able to reach out to them with the assumption that they're not going to reach back out to us and make sure that we keep up with all of their preventive health care and any kind of other social, emotional, psychological support that they might need. Okay. Well, we've come to the point in the program where we have time for just one more question. And uh, it is one where I would admit I have a little bit of a personal stake in it, but I'll ask you, and this is, it, here's the question. Should you become a caregiver for your parents, perhaps, or maybe even for your husband? What have you learned in your work that will affect what you do and how you do it? That's a great question. Um, and I'll tell you what is interesting. It's the same lesson that I learned with Extremis or before I was inspired to help create Extremis, which is it's about advanced care planning. Advanced care planning is not just about do you or do you not want that ventilator. It's not about do you or do you not want that artificial feeding tube. It's also about what are you going to do if you can't be independent? Who's going to take care of you? How's it going to work? What are you willing to do? Am I willing to wear Depends like Bambi was? I think thinking about those things and having conversations with those people in your life for whom you might be a caregiver or a care recipient is just like the plans, the advanced care plans about life prolonging treatments and, and, and the things you do in the ICU, making these plans for the experience of being at home and having caregiving needs met can really make it all go smoother and make everybody a little bit more in control of what happens. So that would be, I think we need to talk about it. You and I need to sit down and talk about all of those things. Um, and, and really, you know, maybe it's playing go wish and, and, and not just thinking about it vis-a-vis -vis the ventilator, but thinking about it vis-a-vis What's our house going to look like? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Jessica Zitter, a physician, co-director and producer of Caregiver a Love Story, and as well as a shout out to Kevin Gordon, her co-director on the film. Also want to thank our viewing audience, all of you. And for those of you who want to find out addition about additional film screenings or uh, our experience, this is a recording and would like to view the film, please visit Caregiver a Love Story, all one word, caregiverlovestory.com. I'm Mark Zitter of the Zetima Project, and now this program of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you.